Welcome back. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Wilson, and I'm here with co-directors Paul Felton and Joe DiNardo and lead actress Stephanie Hayes uh, for a discussion around their film, Slow Machine. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thanks for having us. Thanks for calling in. Uh, maybe, we can, maybe we can start by uh, hearing about uh, the central characters in the film, Stephanie and Gerard, and uh, how they originated um, in many ways, they're archetypal. You know, the, the, there's the woman on the run, the, the secret agent, manipulator, grifter character, but they never fully lean into those stereotypes, I don't think. I think they're layered. Um, uh, sure. I mean, um, I, you know, I, I guess the, the first thing to say about I get what they have in common is that I think they're both... Um, performers primarily, even though Stephanie's the actress and Gerard is the person who's, you know, working for the NYPD in whatever role he has there. I, I think they both are, uh, think of themselves at their fullest when they are performing to some extent. And they're able to do that for each other uh, in a way that they find like stimulating. Um, and I, I was interested in the intersection of, you know, this sort of like uh, person who was in the Brooklyn Kind of bohemian class on the one hand and somebody who's coming from um a much more sort of formal uh context uh and one that we think of as much more um as much straighter uh you know a intelligence agent uh meeting each other and being able to sort of play in this space like they do <laughs> Um, so actually, maybe you can we can go backwards, and uh, if you can, maybe all three of you talk about how you know each other and how you came to work together on this this film. Sure. Joe, do you want to answer the? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, Paul and I met on my first day of college at the Evergreen State College in '97. We had we shared a program together and. Um, became pretty fast friends and just so we've known each other over 20 years now. Uh, yeah, lived in Olympia for four or five years at the same time, worked on the Olympia Film Festival together there a couple times. So we've known each other a long time. <clears throat> and Paul knows Stephanie through the uh, theater scene here in New York. Yeah, Steph and I met at a dinner party uh that was thrown by our mutual friend, Ian Olds and Lily Whitsitt. Ian is one of the editors on this film as well. He's a very good filmmaker in his own right. Uh, and I went and saw Stephanie and her foreman, Richard Foreman play the day after, wasn't it, Steph? Yeah. And we ended up talking after that and it sort of went from there. Um, Go, sir, for my, my point. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think, uh, you know, what stands out really in, in this film for me, at least um, especially on the first viewing, is that there's this really good balance between, I think, the humor in the film and, and I think the themes that maybe aren't so funny, uh, the darker side of the, the characters, maybe like Gerard, and there's also this ambient sort of paranoid tone, sense of surveillance throughout the film. Uh, and I'm curious where or when you found this balance uh, or this atmosphere what if it was something that you maybe felt in the script or something that didn't fully emerge uh, until the shooting or in the edit I, I feel like there were different versions of it in at each stage you know I, I, I don't know about you guys but I think it's present in the script this sense of sort of paranoid anxious claustrophobia yeah I think that was very evident when I read the script I think Paul has a great knack for writing dialogue and um, it was very, it had that humor in it, but also this sort of mysterious, strange undertone of a, 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 a pending danger. Um, and I think that that translated even into when we were shooting, I felt like I wasn't even always sure where we were, if we were in the humor of it or in the, the the dark side of it. It felt like sometimes those things were existing simultaneously. And um, and then of course the added layer of the editing and the um, 
added to that even more. And I think that's sort of what makes the film both uh, mysterious and uh, hard to pin down. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, the plot um, obviously unfolds in a non-linear fashion. And I think one of the most striking things about the edit uh, of this film is the use of flashbacks and flash forwards, uh, if only for a second or two in certain sequences. And uh, I'm curious when or how you cho chose to, to form the film in this way. And it seems maybe it was apparent in the script, but yeah, certain sequences are edited in a way that, that at times call to mind more experimentally mapped films rather than say a genre film. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I wrote the script uh, as a kind of collage of scenes, and then Joe rewrote the movie, Joe uh, and, and, you know, Ian, but mostly Joe, be, uh, because he was the uh, second editor on the film and worked on it the longest, um, rewrote it in the editing and reordered it. I'm also, I, I guess I'm also curious how much of the, the atmosphere and the themes in this film are, are born out of the Phil Larkin's poetry. I mean, he, he's obviously a reference point throughout the film and, and obviously the, the title itself is pulled from uh, one of his poems. Um, I was interested in Philip Larkin at the time when I started this script, which was five years ago, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't go back to him as much uh, now as I used to. But there was something I really liked about his work because it felt both neurotic and crabbed and sort of cosmically inclined at all, all at the same time, you know? It, uh, it was this kind of uh, cranky, uh, you know, guy uh, in his room alone with, with the universe. Um, and I really liked uh, that combination. Um, so I don't know if that answers yeah, he was definitely on my mind when I was writing, you know. I was also thinking about people like Jean Le Carre uh, and uh, Jacques Rivette. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, also of the, the actual, the tone on set and, and sort of what your day-to-day -day collaborations uh, looked like as you were shooting. You, you shot this film on 16 millimeter within and near the city, which isn't necessarily the breeziest way to produce a film. Uh, and so I, I'm curious how this shooting on film uh, uh, was a particular constraint as you worked on set. Um, and uh, yeah, Joe and Stephanie, I'd love to hear how it may have complicated uh, or enhanced performances as well. I think breezy is not the word that I would use for, <laughs> <laughs> for the process of this. No, we shot it over what three years? Yeah. Like we shot oh. it three months after I had a, a child, and then when we finished it, that child was walking and speaking and potty trained. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, and it, but that that, I mean, it was it was um, it was really fun actually to after several months of being apart, come back into this little room with this very small crew. Um, and get back into it, but you know, we had all changed and changed hair, and I'd cut my hair and uh, trying to sort of get back into the story of it. I don't, I don't know how we managed, but I think there was something about the um, the atmosphere on set and the sort of jargon of all of us together as a group that 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 sort of contributed to some kind of consistency. And then the script, of course. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, yeah, there's, it was because it was so small and there's a great, great friendship among all of us, which is very helpful when you take three years to make a film that you can, you know, look forward to seeing each other. Yeah, I mean, I think the combined shoot days, we tried to figure this out. It was probably 20 days or something, but it- yeah stretched out over such a long period because of funding issues that we had throughout the years. But um, definitely a very intimate, small set, small amount of people. Um, me, Paul, sound person, maybe another helper, just in terms of 
uh, like kind of helping us coordinate stuff and the actors and that was it. Um, I think the limitations that 16 imposes uh, because of the cost and the amount of takes you can shoot, we counterbalanced with what was, I felt like a pretty <clears throat> laid back professional set. So the actors had plenty of time to block the scenes for themselves, um, rehearse as much as they needed to. And, and then the added stress of, all right, we don't have a lot of film left, Stephanie, so please nail it. <laughs> <laughs> like during one of my really long monologues. <laughs> Paul primarily knew and found the actors for the parts. So, you know, he was able to get super talented people that um, could handle the text heavy, dialogue heavy screenplay that he had put together. So, yeah. Was there, was there any room for improvisation throughout the film? And at any point? Um, yeah, uh, the scene, uh, I mean, you know, I, I wrote sort of, there's a certain amount of precision, I think, uh, in the dialogue that I wrote, but the actors were free to use words other than what I'd written if that was more comfortable for them. There wasn't any hard and fast rules about, you know, sticking to the text in that way. But the scene near the end of the film where uh, Stephanie's in the sort of like bar space and everybody's getting drunk and she breaks out into song is wholly improvised and was not in the script at all. Uh, and that was Joe's idea. Uh, he had this sense while we were shooting uh, that maybe the script was missing a beat uh, that would involve Stephanie getting to that state and her mask sort of slipping mm -hmm. in that space where she's been pretending to be somewhere else, someone else. Um, and so Stephanie just, uh, picked out a song she knew from childhood uh, and, uh, and and ran with it. It's also and Joe shot it and Joe shot it like a doc like a documentary. <clears throat> it's particularly interesting when you're playing a character named Stephanie Hayes, who's Swedish and who's an actor in New York, which is sort of all those aspects were, you know, true to me in my life. So you get a script and it's sort of it isn't it isn't, it's not my language, but it's meant to be something that is, that I am supposed to make, I have to make it very personal. But I think that Paul and I often say, I mean, I don't know, should we change this word? Should we change this word? And I think you, in terms of the shooting, there was so much freedom in terms of moving around and uh, nobody's talking about hitting a mark or anything. It's just sort of, um, Joe is just following the actors and, and the editing is such too that it didn't, I, I don't think it mattered that we were trying different things. And so the, I, I think I have never been in a film, worked on a film where I've had so much freedom as an actor, actually. I, and I think one of the reasons that that all worked out the way that it did is because you guys were so good at essentially doing your own continuity because you and Scott, especially had both worked on stage so much and had a sense that movement was tied to, uh, or that action was tied to text in a particular way. And so the way you, I mean, the scenes, when we saw different takes, you guys are moving in, in much the same way in each one. It was really, really helpful for us. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm curious if you could maybe talk a little bit more about performance, which is a central theme in the film, and it's also a narrative tool. And, and Stephanie, you and, and, and Scott and others in the film are obviously connected to uh, the theater scene, and so I'm, I'm just wondering how you see, uh, you saw performance um, connecting to the other ideas in this film, especially around doubling and, and the way uh, performance in the film does sort of open up uh, this sort of space for transformation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I I was interested in writing. A character who was at a place in her life where she could be sort of productively restless or rather reckless um, because she was restless and could try on a, a lot of different uh, masks um, uh, in the context of, of the through line of whatever story we were telling. Um, and that became really the starting point for the, for the script for me. Um, and I knew that, uh, I needed somebody who could who could sort of try on all those masks um, in a really exciting and interesting way, which is why I wrote it for Steph. 
And that, I mean, that is also what made it so fun for me is that there was a sort of hunger and agitation in this character that is so um, rare, I find often for, you know, in scripts for women and, um, and that I got to just follow my appetite in that work. I feel like she, she has a big appetite and she's just constantly grappling with it. Um, and that's really fun. That was really fun. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, this, this, the hunger in in Stephanie's character, and I'm, I didn't. This might be my last question, but I, um, as I was watching, I was maybe curious to hear your thoughts on, on the role class plays in the film. Um, broadly, sure, but I think particularly the layers of the creative class, um, uh, that are defined throughout the film, uh, which is sometimes spoken and sometimes sort of hovering around in, in interactions. You know. I think it's President Gerard who's, you know, he, he has that moment where he, he reflects on the state of Brooklyn, but you know, he himself, I think is also this oddball creative who maybe for one reason or another is driven to a more bureaucratic vocation. And, <laughs> and there's that, that scene between, um, w w with Chloe Seveny where we get a sense that Stephanie is more part of the, the kind of the hustling creative class and rather than, than someone who is more, uh, comfortable in their creative uh, endeavor. So yeah, I, I'm wondering how that sort of played out in your minds as, as Paul, as you, were like, as you were writing it and then and, and Joe and Stephanie, as you, were, as you were working through these scenes together. Well, I know that, uh, you know, sort of, not wanting to romanticize being an artist in New York in any way, shape or form was an important in an important part of sort of what I was thinking about when I was writing this script. And one of the, one of the ways to not romanticize it is by reminding people that there are all these uh, sort of tiers at which people are working and competing with each other and uh, uh, congratulating themselves or each other. And I, I'm, I'm interested in the ways in which uh, artists uh, sort of come into contact with power and become complicit with it. Uh, and not just the ways in which art it seems like some kind of alternative to to power. So that was that was on my mind. That's kind of a general statement. Yeah. Steph, did you do you have anything? Do well, you have I, I don't know if this pertains at all, but it makes me really think about the day we shot with Chloe and we showed up showed up on set and we were sort of both asked to bring some things we wanted to wear and we ended up like wearing the same thing and uh, uh, it was just kind of this weird, we wore the same necklace and Chloe and I have the same tattoo and we have, we had at the time the same haircut, like we looked like each other, it was very strange. Um, and which I think emphasized this idea of these two people, um, like what makes one established and one struggling when seemingly they could replace each other or and like how how what does that define um and uh and the fact that you know as somebody who's worked a lot in the theater scene and the downtown theater scene uh in new york where you know people are struggling every day to pay their bills and they're just the most talented people ever and you're wondering like why is this person not more established or well-known and and uh so i think i for me the, the fact that 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 scene and the fact that the way we look in that scene sort of asks that question a little bit. I'd, I, on that note, I, I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the, the supporting characters and actors who appear in the film who have some pretty memorable uh, roles. I mean, obviously, Chloe Sevigny's scene and uh, Eleanor Friedberger. Can you talk about uh, how uh, Eleanor and Chloe sort of came into the, the picture? Yeah, Joe, do you want to take that? Cause uh, cause well, they're, you... both, they're both friends of ours throughout, I guess, a little more focused on my, <clears throat> like, having done a lot of music stuff over the years. So I knew Eleanor and through that, and also Chloe through that, like, her friends from years back. Um, and I had made a short film that Paul wrote that is sort of, for lack of a better phrase like around one of her songs 
from years years back. So um, I think that experience helped inform like her role in Slow Machine and, and like having her and, and music in general as part of this back backdrop uh, to that side of the creative context or something. And they were also willing to do it, you know, like we knew, we didn't just know them, but we knew that they'd be game, which was going to be really important. I mean, Eleanor let us all stay at her house for like four days because that's her place we're in, you know, at the time. People are camped out on the floor. So it sort of approximated, the shooting approximated what you're seeing in the movie. So and, uh, you you wrote sort of around these, these um, friends in mind or? Yep, Eleanor's name is Eleanor in the script and Chloe's name is Chloe and that was always the case. Uh, it was gonna change if, if, if we ended up not being able to get them, but they were kind enough to say yes. Pretty much every main player was written for that person, correct? Yeah, everybody everybody plays a role that was written for them, including the non-actors like Christian Parenti and uh, some of the other people in the script who had really active, Eleanor actually, including it. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't, it's a really, I think, a, represents a, a really fine achievement uh, in the New York independent uh, filmmaking community. I, it's a wonderful film and uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I have, but uh, got anything else? Shout it out. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you.